a skeletal body reflecting an emaciated soul. Cobwebs clung to the corners of my once vibrant heart, of what once had life. I was now just a dark, lonely shadow of hopelessness, spilling out of hollow eyes. Eyes which lost their spark while I wasn't looking. But the hollowness of my eyes was no match for the emptiness inside my deteriorating body. Death would be a blessing, and I didn't realize just how close I was. I wake up, or rather come to. Almost immediately, a surge of anxiety tears through me. Pills, pills, where are my pills? It's not like I don't already have mass amounts of drugs in my system. Oh, I do. In fact, much more than most people will take in a lifetime, I take daily. I move in slow motion, grasping for my pills, a speed in direct contradiction to the racing, pacing fear inside of me. Got to make this feeling go away. Please kick in fast. After 10 times the prescribed amount of two different medications, I am finally able to get out of bed and attempt to make it through another morning. It's not like I planned it to be this way. When I was little, I didn't tell people I wanted to be a drug addict when I grow up. I didn't declare that by my mid-twenties I would lose all hope, hate myself and everyone around me. That I would be a walking stick of death and destruction and chaos and confusion. Had I known my mother feared my death on a daily basis, had I known my brothers were already mourning the loss of their sister, nothing would have been any different. I was too far gone, sucked into a vacuum of drug-induced despair. And that despair met my mother and my brother Eddie at the doorstep when they came to Phoenix to offer me a life raft. Well, that's what I'm told anyway. Apparently my mom had already come once before, but I don't remember that, as a, that at all, just as I don't remember that my brother came even once. And only a blurred snapshot remains of my mom's second visit. Something about conversations with policemen, a hazy image of men in blue standing in the doorway, as I looked down at them from the top of the stairs. But it could have just as easily been a phone conversation that I'm forgetting about. I'm not at all sure. Just as I wasn't sure why John was calling me the day that he did, shortly after I left my boyfriend in our dance studio in Florida. I call the guy John because I have, of course, forgotten his real name. <clears throat> well, John was the owner of a studio at which I had interviewed a few days before but I had no idea why he was calling and was struggling to find some little hint, anything to help me understand what he was talking about. Well, as it turned out, John had already hired me to start teaching. We had agreed on a salary and he would pay my moving expenses and set me up in an apartment for a few months. He was just waiting to hear from me about the cost of the U-Haul. Hmm, really? Well, that was all news to me. All I had was a vague recollection of sitting across from him in his office and discussing some kind of business. He had uppercut colored leather chairs, I think, or maybe they were mustard yellow. I might have been embarrassed, but I'm not sure about that either. Chances are I blamed him for bothering me, because the whole thing sounded like far too much effort and a total pain in the ass. And the mere thought of dealing with a U-Haul was causing static in my mind and a great sense of urgency to end the phone call, as well as the job offer. But had I been asked, in the same breath, I would have said how more than anything I wanted to teach. <clears throat> to bury myself in dancing and students and competition. How dancing provides for me what human beings and food and money cannot. But there was some sick and convoluted paradox that separated me from what I longed for and what I actually went after. Something to do with painkillers killing pain that isn't really there, while creating pain worth dying for, which then needs to be killed even faster and with more frequency. Kind of like how I wouldn't go home with my mom and my brother when they came to Phoenix. But all I ever really wanted was to go home. To find a map that leads to a home without bedrooms or kitchens or backyards. I had been searching for the highway that leads to the door of the home in my heart, the down comforter of my soul. But who the hell has directions to a place with no address? And God knows linens and things doesn't sell such high quality comforters. And so I made a blanket of tiny blue and white pills to wrap myself in. But I wrapped myself up too tightly. And somehow that soft, cozy blanket began to suffocate me, constrict me, and cut off my air supply. One would think such an, an expensive blanket <clears throat> would hold up longer, a blanket whose payments are the cost of one's life. But the irony is that I didn't even realize I was suffocating. 
I didn't seem to notice how I no longer had hips, but rather bones acting as hooks for my jeans to hang on. And stop telling me I'm too thin. And stop telling me to eat more. And stop asking me about my jobs and future and whether or not I'd like to go back to school. And no, I'm not slurring my words. And yes, I only take the prescribed amount of medication. And I wouldn't be so unhappy if you just leave me alone. It's my life, so back off. Just leave me the fuck alone. I suppose love is the only antivenom for drug addict rage. If not, my hatred surely would have killed my family long before. But you have to get this about drug addicts. We never, ever stop loving you. We don't mean to hurt you. We just get confused. In the desperate attempt to find some sense of belonging, we mistakenly separate ourselves from everything we care about. And I think I was just about as separated as I could have gotten when I lost my pill blanket and entered the gap. The gap of bitter cold that exists between the time the blanket is taken off and the time a new one is put back on. That is when the drugs begin to leave the body, when armies of fire ants run through the skin, stinging it, burning it, turning it inside out. The gap is when the seizures start and the hallucinations prevent sleep for days on end. But the gap is also the only way out, the only path that eventually leads to home. Yoshi died in the gap. On a sunny morning in July, as the paramedics and policemen helped what was left of me into the back of yet another ambulance, my little brother's dog lay dying in the backyard. My sweet little brother, Daniel, who a few years before found me passed out in the middle of the afternoon underneath the kitchen table. It was his dog that was dying. At the same time, his dying sister was being taken to the emergency room. I found out later that Daniel had heard that some animals choose to die so a human life can be saved. <sighs> My little brother said that his dog died for me. He died so that I could live. And I don't know why I got to live, I just know that I did. And I didn't just get to live. I got a life I never knew existed when I was running around from state to state, manipulating and scamming doctors, forging prescriptions. I never imagined how much time was available to have incredible relationships with amazing people when it took all I had just to stay awake at the evening's dinner party. I certainly knew nothing of the love there is to give and receive while I was wandering aimlessly up and down the aisles of Walgreens at two in the morning. And I have such appreciation for the calmness of a peaceful summer afternoon because I'm not frantically flying around the country to obtain a passport to get to Switzerland to move in with a man I had just met in yet another attempt to run away from the unbearable realities I had created for myself. I much prefer the beauty of laughter and contribution and the experience of deep, deep joy over shaking uncontrollably on the cold tile bathroom floor, sweating, crying, and praying to a nameless god. And the sex. Oh yes, the sex is so much better when I don't pass out halfway through. <laughs> I did find my way to the home in my heart and would have never guessed how comfortable it is to live in. I hang out there now with my mom and my brothers, drink chai, and bask in the warmth of the sunshine flooding in through the windows.